We the people. Those three words set the foundation for our representational democracy. And with those three words, America declared to the rest of the world that all men were created equal, not the women. And certainly not all the men. We, the people, did not include indigenous Americans whose land we took. We, the people, did not include Africans who we drug here to the free world in chains and then declared to be three-fifths human. We, the people, did not include those individuals we carved out with the Chinese Exclusion Act. We, the people, it's a wonderful beacon and idea, but it, up until now, has never been all the people. Now, in these 250-odd years of our democratic adolescence, we've had some moments. We've had movements and messages and messengers who have pushed us on inclusion from suffrage to Selma to Stonewall to the steps of the US Capitol and the Capitol crawl. The ball has moved forward uncomfortably many a times. And we, the people, has expanded to include those people who until that moment were other. So the issue in many cases for people with disabilities is stigma. We're seen as being weak, ineffectual, helpless. Let's think about some of those civil rights movements. When FDR boldly declared his vision for taking us out of the Depression and into the New Deal, he relied on the confidence of the American people to carry that forward. Now, if we had recognized him as being confined to a wheelchair, a man paralyzed by polio, and that was kept secret for the most part, would he have been followed? And in the 60s, Camelot, right? We went to the moon not because it's easy, but because it is hard. It's audacious. And we did it with an audacious, charismatic leader who exuded youth and vigor. We did amazing things. But had we recognized at that time that JFK was a man with a substantial disability, would we have had the same confidence? Hypothetically, imagine for a moment, if Martin Luther King had been a deaf man, would we have followed Martin to the mountain and heard his message if it was delivered with the help of an ASL interpreter? I don't know. Because disability has always been wrapped in stigma. And it's been hidden. People with disabilities are the largest minority population in the United States. 20%, depending on whose numbers you're going to look at. Some say even more. Yet we often find that we get the table leavings, we get the scraps left over in terms of policy. And you know what? If you're not at the table, you are on the menu. So 27 years ago, the Americans with Disabilities Act codified that we had rights, human rights, civil rights, that we were entitled to equal access to education and employment, to transportation, communication. But we're at a period now where state by state and in Congress, they're working to roll that back. And it's largely because of a lack of representation of people with disabilities in our halls of leadership. While 20% of the American population are people with disabilities, less than 1% of our leadership reflects the disability experience. So it's easy to take away my rights when I'm one of those people, when I'm inconveniently asking for an accommodation. I don't want you to accommodate me. I want you to integrate me. You know who you accommodate? 
your sister-in-law, you know, the really like, the, the, the irritating one that's coming for the weekend, you accommodate her. You know, you, you, you grit it out, you bear it for a finite period of time. But when you integrate someone, you welcome them in. You make them a permanent part of your community. So when we talk about people with disabilities, we often talk about people with special needs. I don't have special needs. My needs are exactly like yours. I need clean air and clean water. I need access to opportunity, to education, to community. If my needs are special, how can I be equal? I do have functional needs, but so do some people who are left-handed, nearsighted, less than five foot four or more than six foot four. Functional needs are an entirely different matter. They're not special. We talk about people with disabilities being a vulnerable population. If I'm vulnerable, can I be strong? I'm not vulnerable, I'm your neighbor. And you know what neighbors do? Sometimes they give someone a hand up, and today it might be me that needs a hand up, and tomorrow it might be you, me giving you that hand up. It's part of our social contract as a community that neighbors help neighbors. And there are times when each of us finds ourselves in need. I'm not vulnerable. And if you describe me as being confined to my wheelchair, can I fight for freedom? I'm not confined to this chair. It's my access to mobility. Words matter. This isn't just being politically correct. How we label something or someone defines its value and its place. We have to carefully safeguard words to ensure that they're accurate and that we are described and portrayed accurately. Imagine if instead of being weak and vulnerable and in need of assistance, if you saw me as a tenacious problem solver who innovates, that's leadership. And so together, we can increase the leadership of people with disabilities in the community from that less than 1%. What would, what would our community look like if 5% of our leaders were people with disabilities? 10. What if we were proportionally represented and everywhere you looked, you saw a leader with a disability of one sort or another, what would our nation look like from that level of problem solving and innovation, that level of inclusion? We the people, it's never been all the people, but we keep moving it forward. So, I'm going to very clumsily uh, paraphrase Dr. King. I have a dream. I dream that one day my children will not be defined by the color of their skin or their perceived ability, but by the content of their character. And maybe then we will find that we, the people, really do include all the people. Thank you.